My name is Andreas Hacke, and I would like to talk about silica. Silica is behind a big part of the development of uh, modern architecture in the US, uh, but at the same time, it's very uh, obviously invisible. Silica is being uh, segregated in different groups, and there's one particular type of silica that produces a glass that is incredibly transparent. And the ultra clear glass is made with a silica that is extracted in Ottawa. And that silica that is exactly the same one that is allowed to increase the, the depth in which fracking can operate. The fact that the silica is very resistant allows it to keep the holes in between the grains of silica, even with the weight of three miles of grains, one on top of the other, pressing to the ones in the bottom. And that allows the gas to flow to the surface. So uh, I'm interested in the way uh, ultra clear glass, that is probably the material that is most clearly capturing the spirit and the kind of way for advanced capitalism to operate, is also behind a big part of the environmental impact that cities have at this point in the US on the countryside. Basically, silica and that particular kind of uh, silica with very low iron content is a silica that is very uh, strong. It has a very high loading capacity and it's very rounded. And that means that when you see in its uh, geological form, it allows the water to flow. It can be compressed, 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 but it doesn't deform, and de therefore it, it keeps voids in between different grains of silica. It works as a sponge. And then there's many, many different species of plants that grow in it, and that, of course, grows in the kind of ecological cycles and then there's insects, there's animals and those particular silica formations have been the place, the habitat of a number of uh, First Nations that were developing balanced ways to hunt in them, to collect plants, to basically uh, coexist with the ecosystem and, and, and not being uh, extracted to it, but rather kind of negotiating their coexistence. But then we can easily see what is the way that advanced capitalism uh, operates by extracting it, uh, segregating the silica from its ecosystems and doing such a refined product like the ultra clear glass. In a way, it started uh, after 1929. Uh, the New Deal uh, had the uh, kind of a, a, a massive plan of mobilizing natural resources through extraction uh, at a scale that was not that much known in the US before. And that was actually happening through modern architecture. When we see, for instance, uh, Miss Van der Rohe's buildings, in Chicago and other places, it's impossible to separate that from a history of basically mobilizing materials uh, putting it together with or assembling those materials to the mobilization of uh, natural gas, uh, transportation systems like the canals that were connecting all these different territories in the Midwest, and basically using architecture as a showcase that would seduce people to, to be part of that uh, model of, of extraction. What is the building that somehow helped me start kind of approaching this is 432 Park Avenue. It could have been others. It could be the Apple stores, right? Because the Apple stores are quite obviously a monument to ultra clear glass. Basically, when we look at the way that that is uh, translated into an architectural language, it's very much to this notion of a transparency that allows to own the exterior by owning the interior. It speaks of a larger way of channeling resources and extracting them from their ecosystems into uh, an accumulation that is concentrated in a very unique part of society. Ultra clear glass and uh, silica in particular, uh, it's clearly an enactor. Uh, like it's, it's enacting this reality. So for me, it's clearly a material because of its resistance, its grain, uh, its color, its uh, many different properties that is connecting many of the uh, worlds and kind of territories where contemporary realities are being produced. It's also been incredibly successful in 
creating the symbols for it, or, or rather providing an aesthetic to uh, societal and, and ecological evolution that other materials have not been able to turn into a culture or aesthetic. Materials are always uh, complicated by the way they expand into industry, into lines of production, into ways of management. And there's so much effort to make them look like if they never break, like if they never had to be replaced, like the, if they never changed. And, uh, and I wonder if the way to deal with it is to give much more importance and to develop a culture about the broken glass. If you think of Gordon Matthew Clark, breaking glasses, there's a whole, uh, culture behind the culture of the shiny, clean glass, of glass being broken as a site for politics, as a site for aesthetic experimentation, as a site for cultural action. And, and I wonder if those, cult, those other cultures are the ones that we need now. In the last years, there's been a number of protests that have been identified glass as an element of protest all around the world in different conflicts. And I would say that probably that's not by accident. Uh, the way both, uh, uh, why this happened and how also those images circulated so massively, I think is telling us of the need to make visible glass. And specifically ultra clear glass. I think that uh, still there's uh, a need to understand why the obsession with glass and why this kind of addiction to glass. In a way, when you have it in your hand, it's already very magnetic. Like a material like that is already telling us of the, I mean, it's very much referring to also the beaches that were uh, selected as premium destination for tourism. So it's aesthetically, there's all these connections that are immediately uh, uh, being produced. Uh, and that we're very, very much trained to identify. So I think that kind of cultural load comes when we see a piece of glass like that. I, I remember I did an exhibition in Korea with a piece of glass like that, just like that. And people would gather to look at it. It's quite uh, magic. It's it really a, 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 a kind of uh, triggers desire in a very clear way. We're addicted to glass, I would say, and we're addicted to a certain extent to ultra clear glass. But my impression is that uh, a way to, to undo that or to go around that will have to acknowledge the, 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 the entire complexity of it. I think we can have shortcuts to that. And I think one is definitely a comparative methodology. If we put an image here of silica in its uh, geological formation as the support of such a kind of rich uh, uh, ecological life. And then we put the, here the, the glass now as kind of the end of a system of exploitation that probably would come through colonization, displacement, racialization, extraction, uh, refinement and abstraction of the materials and ultimately uh, the creation of inequality through, through uh, advanced capitalism. We see that basically from the uh, rich ecosystems to these ultra refined but violent uh, accumulations of systems of exploitation, uh, there's a need to probably take a step back and say, okay, what have we lost on the way? And what are these violences that we have now to deal with and find something exciting in the cracks of this system that we cannot account for without acknowledging all the violence in between. And I think that that's a, a bit where we are, but of course we're, we're doing it now and we're doing it as probably societies that are addicted to, to class and to, to views and to, to transparency. But that's a kind of, good condition to be in, because I don't think this is a moralistic, uh, it's an ethical uh, question, but not a moralistic one. I think that this is really something that we need to unpack as uh, an evolution in the way we understand architecture, environment, societies, ecosystems, and, 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 and that is actually something that requires much more work than just judging it.
following the thread, kind of following uh, the dots in a way, and in all directions, like following the why this class is found here, what is it doing, uh, how is it produced, and how far you can go in kind of following the thread of those questions. For me, it's what, what probably allows you to reconstruct uh, kind of a laboratory for anyone to operate in that. What is interesting is that probably that's the opposite of what uh, in the past designers would do. Like basically it's about not knowing, about not necessarily asking too much, about just knowing exactly what is needed to, to use it. For a long time, architects have looked at uh, materials from a very modern perspective. This is to say basically uh, extracting them from their social, uh, ecological, historical entanglements. I believe that, uh, that the approach that is probably most effective now and that responds best to contemporary defiance is one in which materials are understood as relational, as entangled with many of the realities and with basically uh, uh, no clear boundaries. And I think that that, uh, let's say, notion of a material as part of an ecosystem that it's needed in order to, to understand its critical dimension, in my opinion is something that it's actually not that much a choice, but rather a kind of a, a way to mobilize materials as part of the discussions that are happening now. And, and I think that that is what I would advise uh, someone that wants to work with ultra clear glass or with any material or with anything in this moment to uh, ask questions uh, beyond how to use it and to interrogate uh, the realities that we're working on.